Today there's a stand from Calst Health and they're evaluating her general health. So today I got my blood sugar evaluated and my blood pressure and apparently I'm healthy. <laughs> it was funny, we got the same value with my wife. <laughs> yeah. Personalized medicine is really important because we, I believe, respond best to medical uh, themes, medical uh, interventions that mean something to us. And I think web is a very good opportunity to learn about topics that we are not familiar with. And I'm really excited that CALST organizes this every year in January. Welcome, uh, everyone, for this uh, keynote lecture. Uh, I think we are really very privileged to have uh, Professor René Friedman. Um, maybe some of you know him. Uh, he is really a, a very prominent uh, physician, uh, obstetrician, gynecologist. He's really one of the, the fathers of uh, in vitro fertilization. Very early on, uh, he developed uh, and applied this technology. And in fact, um, I can say that in the French-speaking world, he's considered the, the father of the first uh, in vitro uh, fertilization baby uh, in 1982. And that has opened, of course, uh, considerable um, opportunities for a large number of uh, uh, couples who could not have uh, children. So very briefly, in terms of uh, uh, his background, uh, Professor Friedman is a professor at uh, Université Paris-Versailles, one of the very fine universities in Paris. And uh, initially, he did uh, actually for many years his, his work and his practice and research at uh, the uh, Hôpital Antoine Beclair, but now uh, is working in a, a, a new private public hospital, Hôpital Foch. Um, he, in addition to his uh, scientific and clinical uh, work, uh, Professor Friedman has engaged in a, a large number of uh, uh, organizations, institutions, uh, services to uh, address uh, issues that go beyond uh, the simply, uh, not so simple, but the simply technological or clinical aspect, but in particular uh, the bioethical uh, implications of these technologies uh, for um, the human reproduction. So in particular, he has been uh, a member of the National Committee on Ethics and Sciences that advises the Prime Minister uh, of France for, for, for ethical issues. He's actually uh, been a counselor for the Minister of uh, Research in France. Uh, he received uh, several uh, honors uh, in the French um, honoring system, the Légion d'honneur, different degrees, so that's something very prestigious. Um, and his uh, areas of interest, as I said, are go beyond uh, the technological research and clinical aspects, but uh, include uh, and actually quite, um, quite intensively uh, biomedical ethics and also the preparation uh, or the dialogue with, the, with society. Uh, these are issues that can raise uh, questions and uh, um, uh, sometimes even antagonism, particularly in France there have been uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know, resistance in certain, area, in certain you know, areas of society. So uh, it's important to maintain the dialogue and, and really Professor Friedman has been an example for, the, for this and to explain and, and, and discuss the implications. Um, it's, um, it, it will talk today about the personalization of artificial reproduction techniques and uh, treatments. 
before I leave the floor, you saw a, a short movie uh, that, as you, those who have been walking on the spine, uh, have seen this installation in front of the library. And uh, on behalf of WEP and on behalf of uh, the uh, KAUST in general, I would like to thank, uh, of course, KAUST Health and um, Suleiman Faki, uh, Dr. Suleiman Faki Hospital for uh, their support and sponsoring. So before, uh, uh, without further doing, uh, I would like to leave the floor to Professor Friedman and, and thank him to have taken time from his uh, quite busy schedule uh, to come here and tell us about these important issues. First of all, thank you very much for this invitation. It's really a great pleasure. I came in Jeddah 15 years ago, but the coast was just a, a project ongoing. And it very thank you for the dean and all the organization committee to invite me. The question was to discuss the personalization in medicine, and especially, I mean, in my field with the artificial reproduction techniques and treatment that I want to show and discuss uh, with you. First of all, you know that infertility, it's a problem everywhere in the world. And uh, even in a country where women have a lot of child, when one woman who want a child, because there is women who don't want a child, of course, but when women don't have a child, she will be discharged for the family and the group of uh, social friends. So it is something very important. And uh, in fact, if you look at the number that uh, we had in uh, our country, we can see that there is an increase, a dramatic increase of the treatment for infertility since 20 years, we will say, 300% of uh, increasing of the treatment. So are you going, if you are a doctor, to give for everybody the same treatment? Will you try to personalize the situation? Of course. But before we start, just uh, some word of the history, because at the beginning, to 200 years ago, people believed that uh, all the humanity was inside the woman of ovaries. Then after, it was a description by the microscope uh, by von Leeuwen Oeck. It was a description of the sperm uh, animal. And we begin to understand that, uh, in fact, perhaps God play a role. Perhaps there is hazard who play a role but you must have a mixture of uh, sperm on one side and ovulation in the other side. The treatment, in fact, beside all the mythology and all the um, false uh, folk news, of course, begin a long time ago with the insemination. That means to bring the sperm near the ovulations position, that means in the uterus. And of course, it was a big uh, step when uh, um, Dr. Dickinson proposed to make an insemination with a donor sperm. But of course, it changed completely the situation of the filiation and begin the ethical problem that we have discussed in a few, a few minutes before. Let's, for people who are not familiar with that, if you do an IVF, what does it mean? It means that the meeting of uh, sperm and ovulation will be outside of the body, will be in the lab. For that, it's an in vitro fertilization. Well, to, for a doctor to explain to a man how to do, I mean, by masturbation, the collect of the sperm is one thing easy, but for the woman, it's very complicated. So you can see that, uh, oh, I'm going to go back. 
you can see that there is different step. The first one will be to collect the oocyte, and that must be a surgical intervention. The second step is to collect the sperm. The third step is to, to put sperm and oocyte in in vitro fertilization. And the last step, two days after, or six days after, depending on the development of the embryo, human embryo, will be to put it back in the uterus very carefully. In fact, it's an increasing, a tremendous increasing of knowledge a few years ago. And we understand that when a sperm is going inside the oocyte, as you can see through this picture, the other's oocyte will not be able to go inside. There is a, a closing system. The oocyte wants only one sperm. Why? Because you are, and I am, normally for 46 chromosomes. When there is a fertilization in the man, the sperm make a division, 23 chromosome. The woman make a division, 23 chromosome. That means that when there is a meeting, it will become 46 chromosome. If not, there is something wrong, and there is uh, bad things, of course, you know. So, in the project to make uh, this um, fertilization in vitro, there is one team from England uh, who is uh, very famous because uh, he really developed first in animals during the year of 61, 60 uh, last, uh, last uh, period. And he decided to go to humans, that is Bob Edwards, who has the Nobel Prize uh, 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 some years later. After. The first pregnancy was obtained was an extra uterine pregnancy. That means that uh, when he put back the embryo, the embryo go in the fallopian tubes. But he succeeded with the birth of Louis Brown. That is really a very important step because it was the first time that a baby become alive after six days in the lab. Not all the pregnancy, six days. If uh, we look at which step we were confront, uh, we, we, we have to, to discuss. First, it was the outside donation that was done by Australian people, who understand that uh, if you take, if a woman don't have an ovulation, and if you take an outside coming from another woman, and if you make a fertilization with the sperm of their husband, the new embryo will not be rejected. And that is something special. It's immunological approach. Because normally, I mean, our body, if there is some cells uh, coming from a, a strange, another people, we will, it will be rejected. You know this uh, situation but not in the pregnancy, and in the pregnancy, it's always, the man is always somebody else than the woman, of course, and the baby is not rejected if there is uh, no uh, illness. And in this case, outside donation, the oocyte and the sperm are different, and there is no rejection. So it's a medical problem, very interesting. The other step, was in 84, the same in was the country was the Australian, but it was not the same team. It's Alex Lopata, who begins the first one, and the second one is, the, uh, is Alan Tronson. What he does, he put the embryo on the, the ice, and we begin to develop the freezing of the embryo. The freezing of the sperm have been done 15 years before, and now we do the freezing of the oocyte. So just two minutes, if you think about the freezing, it's so strange that you put an embryo in ice, special ice, and 10 years after, 15 years after, it can become and develop and become what you are. And you will see that um, 
many problems will be developed in this uh, field. So, as I told you, the first step very important was the success of Louis Brown, and it's 40 years ago, more than 40 years ago. And uh, at this time, we were only, I mean, 40 people, pioneers in this field who wanted to develop this technique. As I say this morning at the broadcast, uh, now when we have a congress, a medical congress on in vitro fertilization, and there is also some team from, uh, from Jeddah that I know, uh, there is uh, 12 or 15,000 people who come to this congress because it's very involved everywhere in the world. But at this time, I'm in the middle, a little younger, just a little, and we were only 40. With my team, we begin in France and we make all many first delivery and many first uh, births after fertilization, after uh, freezing, after uh, PGD that we will see that it's a possibility to analyze the, the one cell of the embryo. And every, every time there is something new to to go better to the problem, individual problem of infertility that we will be in front of. As I told you, the first step is to take out some oocytes. Normally, in a normal cycle of a woman, beginning at uh, normally 13 years and finishing about uh, uh, 48 or, or 50 years, you will have one oocyte, one ovulation every month. But if you want to have a better results of this technique, at the beginning we were looking for one oocyte at each time, but if you want to have better results, you will give ovarian stimulation to have in one cycle different and many oocytes to have a possibility to different embryo and even to choose the embryo we will discuss on that. So one of the problems will be how many oocytes you need to develop uh, the success of this stimulation. And we will look on that carefully together. First of all, how can we stimulate the, uh, the oocyte, the ovulation, by the human gonadotrophin. That was uh, proposed by Bruno Lunenfeld in uh, Switzerland. It was proposed 70 years ago. He showed that uh, gonadotrophin, what is gonadotrophin? Is hormonal who come from the pituitary gland, which is under the brain, and send two different hormones, the FSH and the LH, will go to the ovary. So from the pituitary gland, you have two hormones will go to the ovary. And the ovary, in response, will send another hormone, estradiol and progesterone, to prepare the uterus for the implantation of the embryo. So for necessity of the violation, you need to have human gonadotrophin spontaneously, or if you give more and more, you will have a better response of the ovary, because human gonadotrophin are necessary for the growth of the follicle each month, and if you give many gonadotrophin, with you more than natural, I mean, you will have a multi-ovulation. So that means that uh, if you want to control the ovarian stimulation, and there is still many publications on that, you have to find how to produce a high quantity of oocyte, not to miss the ovulation time and to collect, and then to put the oocyte in the lab. You can see here uh, a uterus uh, ah, yes, okay. You see, you see the, the uterus here? Whew. 
<laughs> and you see a catheter inside with a little uh, white uh, thing, and the embryo is here. And if we proceed in life situation, you will see that we go slowly with a little catheter, and you follow the embryo, and the embryo will be pushed in the uterus. The woman don't sleep. It's a normal uh, situation. And then up, we send the embryo, and we take back the catheter, and we hope that this embryo will implant. That's the last step of the, ovarian, uh, uh, of the IVF procedure. And we hope that it will be a success. But of course, the success is not uh, always here because, in fact, ovarian stimulation cannot be the same for each woman. And it begins, perhaps, to have a personalized approach. First of all, it depends if the ovarian stimulation will be too much you will have, as you can see on this uh, side, too much follicles, and that can give uh, an hyperstimulation, which is not a good thing, of course. You can have multiple pregnancy, and you can have also, perhaps, if you give too much ovarian cancer. So that means that you have to decide how you will give this ovarian stimulation, not too much and enough. In fact, each woman has an own ovarian reserve. That means that you have to understand who is in front of you. Because there are some women who have a high production of uh, oocyte, others with very low. So it depends on the age of the BMI, and uh, the, you will assess the ovarian function by hormonal criteria and by a ultrasound. In fact, there is three categories of women. First of all is a poor, what we call the poor responder. That means that uh, this kind of woman have a, ooh, I'm, ooh, come on baby, yes. In this, you have only one or five follicles. If we go to the optimal, it's eight to 15. You see that there is more in the ovary. But if you, if you see the follicles here, that's the black. And some of the women have what we call PCO. That means that they have ovarian polycystic syndrome with too much ovary, and they can be very dangerous to stimulate this kind of woman. So you have to know what is the situation of each woman. Of course, it's situation of quantity, and also on quality, because for the same production of treatment, you will have different response following the polymorphism of the receptor of the FSH and the LH. The ovulation is very complicated. We really we need a new search, research to understand all the things, because when you have an ovulation, in fact, all the story begins three months before. The growth of the follicles, the maturation of the oocyte inside, it takes three months. So, I mean, when you will give some treatment, it's just the last period. But in fact, everything begins a long time before. So we have to understand a little more what is exactly the, the physiology of the ovulation. Anyway, we will make perhaps some algorithm who is very important to personalize with taking account the basal level of FSH, the BMI, the age, and the antral follicle count to characterize each woman to decide which treatment we will give to her. Because, as I told you, it's not the same thing, and you cannot apply a protocol the same for everybody. In fact, there is a lot of uh, pharmaceutical company who develop uh, different uh, recombinant FSH, LH, HEG, hormonal who are necessary for the uh, ovarian simulation, as you understand. 
but new uh, way for long-acting recombinant FSH, and perhaps, and I'm personally involved in this research, to have a, a non-peptide molecules and potentialization of FSH receptor by monoclonal antibody. So there is really a very big field of research on this quality of the first step. The second step of the in vitro fertilization was the laparoscopy, that you look inside the, the, the body to take out the oocyte. But now we will use only better would be the ultrasound. And you can see on this uh, slide, and you can see here, yes, the ultrasound in the vagina. And with a needle, we go in the ovary to pick up the oocyte. That's the general situation now. Well, you can see here a uh, human oocyte. You can see the beginning of uh, an embryo because you see that there is two nucleus. Each nucleus in 23 chromosomes. You have two blastomere and four blastomere. That's the beginning of uh, uh, human life. You have also blastocyst, which is very important on D5, because here is the embryo. And here you can see all these uh, other cells are the um, future placenta. After six or seven days, uh, the embryo will go out of uh, his, uh, his, uh, his zona, and he will implant in the uterus. The problem is uh, everybody need a man and a woman for that, sperm and oocyte, of course, but the embryo itself is, uh, must be understand, and the implantation must be understand, and will you have to do some examination before to get the baby. The object will be for men and women to understand what is the other factor, and perhaps it's uh, what uh, Professor Magistretti said before, the importance of the environment who can interfere with the results. First of all, we have to, to be sure that inside the uterus there is no myoma, as you can see here. There is no adhesion, as you can see here, and or other polyp. That is the, the way we go inside the uterus and we look at that. The ovary, I told you that uh, you have to decide if it's a poor responder or very high responder. You will look if the fallopian tube are present, as you can see here, because that is ultrasonography, or are very normal or are blocked. That means that um, first you have to make examination for every partner and very carefully. And the human embryo who succeed will be different. And you can examine by embryo biopsy, as you can see here. The embryo is fixed by this, uh, this uh, needle. And you can take out one or two cells and to examine genetically or other analysis. If you want to, to look at the development of the embryo very early, you can have now the possibility to see. Look carefully because you will see that uh, this embryo will develop uh, progressively. It's a, a quick acceleration, of course. Hmm, I get it before, but uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work. I'm sorry, the, the video is not going because you see the division of the embryo, but um, it's not going on. Let's go. Perhaps we'll do it after. So you can make the biopsy of the embryo and have the genetic testing for aneuploidy. So perhaps it will be the future to understand for every embryo what is the possibility to develop 
if it's normal or not normal. Also, inside the embryo, there is a fluid that we can make the analysis of uh, DNA that you listened this morning. And in the medium where the first day of the embryo developed, he rejected also some DNA that we can analyze. So there is invasive and non-invasive method who can give you an idea of the potential development of the embryo that have been published in different uh, uh, good publications. And the endometrium where the embryo will implant is also something very important. There is, we know, a genetic uh, situation who give a good receptivity for the implantation and, and not. So we have to work to understand which oocyte, which, which uh, sperm, which uh, uh, embryo, and which, of course, which um, endometrium. What you see on the table is the uterus. It's a uterus that uh, we develop in the world uh, a possibility to graft, to transfer, to transplant this uterus from a woman to another. You know that there is a cardiac transplantation, lung transplantation, and there is also hand transplantation. But uterus transplantation was not done before. It's not a vital situation. But there is some woman who give, who, who, uh, when, when um, at, at the birth, they are completely normal, just the uterus is failing. That's the syndrome of Vortikonsky. And the only situation that we can do is to try to transplant the uterus. That is uh, since uh, three or four years, no more. And it was a meeting in the USA uh, three months ago showing that uh, there is 18 babies that have been born after uh, transplantation of the uterus. In our department, uh, we have done one transplantation from the mother who was 57 years old to the, the, her girl, 30, uh, 34. And it, was a, it is a success and we are uh, waiting for the, the, the pregnancy now. The male must be also analyzed, because males are not comparable. There is men who have uh, uh, azoospermia, who have sperm with uh, some vacuole, like you can see on this, uh, on this picture. That means that um, there is many examination to do before, and it's very, I go a little quick because it's too important, to understand that each man can have also an examination, a personalized aptitude to understand what is his capacity to fertilize. The environment is also special because uh, we know that the consequence of a sexual problem of smoking or cannabis or alcohol or stress is uh, important for the woman and for the men uh, if you look at the desire of a, of a baby. Obesity, for instance, obesity play a bad role in uh, the, this situation. And this impact of obesity on sperm parameter have been shown. And of course, I will not say that it is a contraception, <laughs> but uh, it is a uh, playing a bad role in the uh, desire of a baby. Also for the woman, and especially because the uh, obesity women have many times uh, um, the polycystic ovary syndrome. Smoking is also uh, a relation with the de decrease of fertility, and there is a lot of uh, publication showing that uh, the activity of the ovary can be impacted by this uh, kind of uh, situation. And especially also the stress, the psychological stress, will uh, have a bad response on the ovarian reserve and the contraception. Of course, 
you look at the people, but not only at the body and the physiology. It depends also of the situation of the family, of the, if they, what they believe, who are they. You must know a little more of that, what is licit and not licit. Look, for instance, for the religious situation, that uh, if you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, and you look at the Quran about uh, the question, when a human being begins, is it at the beginning of the fertilization? It is at the implantation. It is when there is a, a syst nervous system, when there is a delivery. It's still ongoing discussion in ethics with that. Because now, for instance, for the woman, and you can see on this picture of Dali, that in fact he say, we can interpret this, uh, this picture, but there is different mother. There is mother who can give one outside. There is another mother who can give mitochondria, not outside, but mitochondria, around the nucleus. There is another woman who can be also a mother to, who will wear the, the embryo and develop the embryo, and can be another mother who will take care of the baby after. You see that uh, there is a changing in the, in the situation that we knew until now, that there is a possibility of different approach to the motherhood. What will be the future? It will be the artificial uterus, that means that uh, we will develop, uh, as we develop for the cardiac system, for instance, uh, all circulation of uh, blood, to develop this artificial uterus during nine months. Uh, will, will we uh, change the human uh, genetic um, capacity? And you know, for instance, that um, in, um, in some country, uh, it was uh, done uh, uh, with a CRISPR Cas9. Cas9. It was doing uh, some uh, change in the embryo, and uh, but the doctor, who the scientist, scientist who do that, is uh, get uh, three years in uh, in prison because he's not allowed to change the human uh, capacity. So that's a big discussion because another way you will see, okay, but if there is a gene that we know that it is uh, uh, responsible for uh, uh, illness. Perhaps we can take it off and change it. But there is a high risk to do that, but that will be to discuss in the future. So, in fact, from evidence-based medicine, we will give you some protocol, some direction how to do that, how to stimulate, how to transplant, how to analyze, you have to go to personalization situation that uh, you must know exactly the, the genetic, the epigenetic, the desire, the psychology, and of course the physiology of the both people who are in front of you. Uh, certainly that we will in, in increase our knowledge by using the artificial intelligence uh, healthcare um, to improve the clinical team results outcome because now we will say that is not perfect. The results are only 30% of the cases have a baby after one attempt. So this personalized approach, it is essential to improve the results but need to have a better improvement in the control of ion simulation, the choice of embryo with uh, knowledge of the capacity to implantation, the immunological improvement to reduce uh, recurrent pregnancy loss, and to use the artificial intelligence to improve all the data of this human reproduction. Well, thank you very much. I still uh, thank the organizer for inviting me. And we have in Paris now an exhibition about uh, Alula, in the in a big museum, uh, Muslim museum in Paris, and uh, it's a pleasure to be there. And I say, I hope that next time we'll make a, a tour to see Alula. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. That was very inspiring and interesting to see how reproductive health has evolved in the last 10 to 20 years. I have a question about this new tendency that you hear about in the, no in the younger generation. Uh, women in their 30s, there are a few startups that have, they are organizing egg harvesting. And um, at least in North America and Europe, I don't know at all about other parts of the world. And they get together, these young women, uh, and go on a trip to Spain, where they have very good clinics apparently, and it's less expensive, and they do egg harvesting. Because they think that they are in a stage of their career where they can't afford to have a baby, so they make sure that they have. So what is your uh, view on this? Well, first of all, I must say that especially in Europe, uh, the desire of a baby, the volunteer to have a baby, come later than before. The first baby is 30 years. So, so in, if you look 30 years to 40, because after 40 it becomes difficult, it's only 10 years. So it's not too much. So that's true that uh, some women who are involved, uh, especially in some university like Coast, where the women are very strictly, you know, have, have to work uh, day and night. No, I'm joking, of course, but I mean, sometimes, uh, Women are, well, first they don't have a prince, they don't find a good, a good boy. Uh, secondly, they are working and they want to develop their capacity. So, but they see that uh, they are coming more and more near the frontier where the difficulty will become. So that's true that we can offer to preserve the fertility by taking off the oocyte and freeze the oocyte because we can freeze your side, and then two years after, three years after, five years after, we will can make an in vitro fertilization, or not, because perhaps you will be pregnant naturally, but I mean, if not, we can use this oocyte for her and to make the in vitro fertilization. So it is a possibility that develop, and you mentioned that in USA especially, and some place in Europe, but we must be careful. I mean that, uh, First of all, it's not a solution uh, guarantee at 100 percent because uh, the success is not uh, always there. So it's complicated because you have uh, to have a stimulation, you have, uh, have to have a side pickup. So I mean, it's not like that. But we must discuss and accept some situation when you give all the information of that. Hello. Uh, end of last year, there were a couple of papers uh, describing the synthetic embryos that were made from a special type of prepotent stem cell that can give rise to uh, the placenta and the embryo. Uh, did you? Synthetic embryo. Synthetic embryo. That was grown from cells, from cultured cells. This was done in mouse. So I want to hear your opinion from ethics point of view. Uh, well, if this is uh, acceptable for humans. In fact, it's not synthetic embryo. It's, uh, it's uh, coming from artificial gametes, artificial sperm or artificial, uh, artificial oocyte that can be fertilized, not both, but one of them can be artificial. How is it possible? You know uh, that in the so blastocyst... I was talking about a, a different study. It's yeah. not this. It's a... Uh, the cell type is called extended pluripotent stem cells. So these cells can grow in culture and give rise to embryonic and extra embryonic tissues. So scientists were able to make an artificial embryo, like synthetic embryo. Yes, I w j j j two things, I mean, in your question. First of all, there is a possibility to artificialize the embryo by doing, I, I will finish with that and I come to you. Uh, to, to, to doing uh, artificial gametes, okay? Coming from the stem cells. If coming from the stem cells, you know that stem cells on day six of the embryo will give all the cells that we have, brain uh, and uh, liver and everything. So it, you can have some gametes and you can have fertilization. That means that you can have uh, a, 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 an embryo. But if you take, for instance, 
Um, if I take the cells of the skin of uh, my DIN, coast DIN, and I take his, um, his nucleus and 46 XY, okay? And I put in an in a oocyte from a woman who gives the oocyte, and I take off the, the nucleus of the woman and I put his nucleus for 46 chromosome. It will develop in an embryo, that we, what we call the cloning. And this embryo can be stopped in day six to have uh, the, the cells, the stem cells, or if we put it back in the uterus, perhaps it will develop and give a birth. But uh, until now, this cloning is not allowed to do. So it was, uh, the beginning of that was done in some uh, animals, of course, the cloning in animals now since, uh, since uh, 20 years is uh, well done but not in human. It was published that it was perhaps the beginning of a cloning in, by China's uh, uh, team, but it's not sure. So there is two things in my mind. Or you make artificial gametes, and it will come certainly, and with some uh, ethical problem, or you make cloning by coming, as I tell you, and if you want some... I don't know if I want to be <laughs> I don't know. Perhaps uh, the majority of the, of the assembly want to, <laughs> to be cloned. Other questions? Uh, my question is, what do you think uh, the impact of lifestyle changes is it, um, on fertility? So yeah. things like plastics, um, I guess, yeah, climate change, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Environmental topics yeah. like plastic and all that. Yeah. You, you're right. I mean, all, all, all this, to the quality of the air, the quality of what we eat, the quality of uh, all the plastic and uh, phenol, uh, phenol steroid and other things play a role. We don't have exactly the measurement of this impact, but we know that um, when it's for that, when you have a couple in front of you, Look at what is eating, what is doing a sport, what is uh, where I live, and what is the condition. Because certainly, can we, we believe that it plays a role. Not only the big uh, technical proposition, but also the way of life and the epigenetic environment. We know, for instance, you know that uh, for, during a pregnancy in France, there is some uh, there is some situation of the woman drink a lot of alcohol. And if she drink alcohol, it will become a very, very complicated situation for the baby. We know that there is relation in that. So with a little thing like uh, environment that we don't know exactly what in the food, in the air, and everything, the, all the pollution that we have, and perhaps the, the for instance, uh, well, all these situations can be a factor. Uh, okay, thank you for an amazing talk. And as you told that the last step is that you take the oocyte and you put it to uterus. But still there is a probability to, for this pregnancy to be interrupted. Do you do something uh, to avoid it? Because of course it costs money, it costs time. You don't want your work to be wasted, right? No, in fact, uh, we don't know exactly, well, we know that the interruption of the pregnancy, the majority of the case, will be an abnormality of the, of the chromosome arrangement. That's the majority. 80% of the uh, spontaneous abortion in, is in relation with that, okay? So it's for that all the examination that you can do on the embryo, uh, for instance, on the fluid of the embryo or all the cells of the embryo showing that you have a normal constitution in, uh, in autosome, in, in chromosome, will avoid the abortion. So you can play a role by avoiding abortion, especially in women who make a lot of abortion, by uh, choosing the embryo with normal equipment of a chromosome uh, and a chromosome abnormality. I think it's the only way, of course, and, and what we just say, 
um, I mean, to have a, a correct life, a quiet life uh, during pregnancy, but I mean, at the beginning, it's a chromosome, majority is a chromosome abnormality. So if we know, if we can detect by blaster cells, by uh, DNA in the medium culture, if we can detect in, uh, in the analysis of the embryo, which embryo are abnormal, we will avoid this. Thank you very much. Oh, hi. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if there is like any sort of correlation between in vitro fertilization with like some sort of um, health problems. Like are, are there studies uh, tracking even like in kids or in, in adults? If there is a... The babies that are born in vitro fertilization have... Different. Ah, okay. Yes, there is, some, uh, there is some difference. We know, for instance, that the baby born after a freezing time uh, are larger than the others. Uh, we make a lot of comparison of uh, different methods. I uh, mean, for instance, normal in vitro fertilization, ICSI, when you put inside the sperm, inside the oocyte, when you make a freezing technique. Uh, but in fact, it's not a big problem, but there is some difference. And that means that the beginning of life, the medium, the different possibility of development, even for a few days, uh, can influence after, but not, not, the, not uh, too much, you understand? For instance, the difference of weight, it's only 50, 50 grams. But there is something, and uh, every, everybody compare uh, this, uh, this uh, situation. So, uh, we must be careful, I mean, when we change something in the lab where the human embryo will be developed uh, before it goes to the uterus. Thank you. Thank you. Considering the distress of the families trying to have babies or healthy babies, and then on the other side, society is being against new techniques, where do you think should be the red line that we should not cross? Well, I will say that uh, the red line for me is uh, when uh, there is a deleterious consequence of your decision. That means that, um, for instance, if the cloning uh, that we just discussed, and uh, we did, did happen, but it could happen, um, if you decide what will be the child, for instance, uh, with this characteristic or not this characteristic? If you interfere with that, I think that you take a power. And uh, for the child, he, he must be free and uh, not in, the, because you know, for instance, there is a couple who wanted that the baby is a deaf, not a hearing, um, because they are not, uh, they are deaf a couple too. So, I mean, all these situations, we, uh, we can interfere with the, with the capacity of a normal human being to be free. And the other thing is, for instance, I'm not personally uh, in favor of uh, the, um, uh, you, um, how do you say, a woman who wear a baby for another one, gestation, surrogate mother, thank you. I'm not uh, uh, for that because I think that it is a use of the, the body of a woman for your own desire that we can understand. But uh, it is an exploitation, and we, we know that in India and everywhere, uh, the women are paid for that. And uh, that, for me, is a red line. Because uh, you must, when there is a new thing that can appear, always you can ask the question, why we do that? And if somebody of the, of the participant will be um, it will be deleterious for, for him. Of course, the discussion is open. A uh, couple of questions and then we have to close over there. Um, I know and that... Here, these two here and then this one. Okay. 
So I've heard of a lot of women who can't get pregnant, they're infertile, once they do this IVF, it'll kind of jumpstart the reproductive system. I was wondering if there was a way oh to là. predict the effects of the body after you do your initial IVF. Si je dire, je rien. Uh, can you repeat the question? If there's a way to, ah. oh, can you hear, sorry. <laughs> um, I know some women, after they do IVF, it'll kind of jumpstart their reproductive system and so they could have babies naturally. I was wondering if there was a way to predict how your body will respond to IVF, if you want to have multiple kids, if you'll always have to do IVF, or if, is there a way just to predict how your body will respond? Is that? Mm. Oh, <laughs> <goodness>. <laughs> you need a translator. <laughs> I'm sorry. You, you try yeah, that. You may be. So after IVF, and if you want to have another baby, okay. will the ba will the body be able to have a baby without IVF ah, possibly, okay. or will you have to always have IVF? Well, it depends why you you get IVF. For instance, if you get IVF because you are you don't have a fallopian tubes after two extra uterine pregnancy, okay, you will never be spontaneously pregnant. So you have to repeat. You understand? But of course, sometime. We have a surprise because uh, it was a long time that uh, the woman uh, wanted to be pregnant and we decided to make an IVF because we don't know what to do. Uh, but in fact, she became pregnant spontaneously uh, after. So it depends what is the reason of uh, doing IVF. And perhaps in another question, now that the IVF procedure become more and more frequent and perhaps too more, too frequent. We have to decide if it's really necessary or only to wait a little time and to give some, um, some indication of the environment, of the uh, way of life, you know, that can interfere. It depends on the age of the woman, of course, because when 30 years you can give, a, you can take a little time. When you're 40 years, you don't have time. So one question and then the last one, please. It must, it must be a great feeling to have uh, life in your hands and to eventually contribute to the health of the nation. Uh, I have a question um, from a scientist to uh, IVF specialist. Uh, we developed here the nanofabrication core lab, a microfluidic device for uh, sperm sorting. Um, how how um, um, is this use is, is a common practice? Is used every time you you do the sorting? Uh, uh, what, what would you want from uh, this device? Is the only the motility important? Ah. You mean, if I understand well, you mean the examination of the sperm? Yes, uh, yes. All the characteristics. Sort, yeah. yeah. Well, in fact, I must say that. Uh, we, must, we know better on the situation of the woman than the men. We don't know exactly how to recognize the, because we need only one sperm and you know, and there is a, a high quantity of sperm and it's very difficult to, to decide which sperm you, you, you will choose even if you put one in the, in the oocyte. So it's a general indication uh, of the, both of the, the three, I mean the motility and the capacity and uh, the development of the, of the integrity of the sperm, for instance, the vacuole that you have seen. So it is important to, to give uh, uh, all this indication to characterize the uh, men fertility uh, uh, progress, but in fact, uh, it, it's, it's a little complicated to say that uh, this man will uh, fertilize, this man will not fertilize. Of course, if there is a very, very low level of a sperm, it, it, will, it will be easy. But for a different variation, we don't have a very good uh, indicators on the quality of the sperm because we don't know which spermatozoid will fertilize. Last question here. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, and for your contribution for the reproductive health. Um, my question is related to uh, mitochondrial diseases. Uh, some woman suffers from deleterious mitochondrial diseases, and there was this new technique where you transfer mitochondria from another mother into the egg, and then you fertilize the egg and implant it. So basically the baby has three parents. So my question is, how developed is this technique now, and how successful is it? 
and what are the ethical and legal implications of uh, the three parent babies. Uh, I understand that the UK approved this technique and they use it, but I want to know the ethical legal implication of it and, and if it's approved elsewhere in the world as well. Well, you're right. I mean, there is some um, situation, uh, there is a, a, a not a normal mitochondrial system. So there is two possibility. Or we, we, exam, we make the examination of the embryo, of the quality of the mitochondria, and we know that there is some embryo who will be correctly developed and the other will not. And we not transfer, we make the pre-implantatory diagnosis of that, and we have done that in Paris many times. But because there is a repartition in uh, embryo with a bad mitochondria and embryo with good mitochondria. So if you know and you look, you will choose this one, of course, and we have some births like that. But sometimes, it is very rare, you have a, such a, a perturbation of the mitochondria that you will never add a normal embryo. So in this situation, it was proposed to change the, not the nucleus, but the cytoplasmic around the nucleus, and then to bring the mitochondria. But at, until now, I, as I know, there is only three baby born in the world uh, with that. But I remember that uh, a, an American team, um, Jack Cohen, uh, have done injection of uh, new mitochondria in uh, old uh, oocyte. Um, he was thinking that uh, perhaps uh, uh, giving this uh, energy with a new mitochondria, it will help to develop the embryo. And in fact, he, he get 10 pregnancy, but unfortunately, the, some of the baby was uh, destabilized, was uh, with problem. So the Food and Drug Administration asked to stop that. So to add mitochondria like that, is, it's, uh, it's forbidden until at, at, at this moment, okay? But to replace all the cytoplasmic, we have only three baby born, and I don't know exactly how many, because in different countries, the same, is the same um, doctor, uh, Dr. Zhang, that I know him because he was learned, came in my hospital too, but I don't know exactly how many uh, cases have been proposed and how many results, you know? So I think it's uh, one of the, this category of uh, new development must be very well controlled, why not? But uh, very well controlled, and the truth that England propose also to do that, but we are waiting for some results. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> and, <laughs> and to bring back home. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I take a big suitcase. <laughs> I thank you very much. You're welcome. And uh, just a reminder, uh, there uh, is the movie tonight at 8, uh, the title is Gataka, like the